stronger is the one within us. Stronger is the one who fights for us. He will never fail. You will never fail. For your love endures forever. For your love endures forever. Twickenham, glad you're here this morning. Thank you for being here. I know we've got some visitors here this morning because I met some Georgia fans, so <laughs> glad you guys are here. That's the Christian section right in there, so no, it's a, glad you're here. If you're a guest from in town, really glad you're here. If you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members and would love to talk with you about what God's doing here in our church, love to hear what he's doing in your life and where those two roads can merge and we can travel together. So glad you're here. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can put any prayer requests you have on that card and we'll be praying about those this week. And then you put those in the collection plate when they pass a little bit later in our service. Um, I've had, my phone's been blowing up this morning uh, with texts from family members and uh, some old friends. Um, I've got an uncle that I've mentioned in sermons before as being maybe the, the godliest man I've ever met, um, who is in the hospital right now with kidney and liver failure. And so been, we've been getting a lot of texts from cousins, and it's my mom's brother, and she loves him dearly. So that's been on my heart. Then I got a text from an old golfing buddy of mine back in Atlanta, and uh, his mom just had a stroke. And then I got to thinking about all the stuff that I've heard this week that's going on in the life of our church, in your lives, in your family's lives. And for a lot of us, it's been a tough time. Uh, we are in a season of struggle, a lot of us personally, right now. So this morning's service is going to kind of center around the idea that God is with us, and even in the midst of the struggle, we are not alone. But even in the midst of that, we can rejoice because he is with us. Let me ask you to stand. I want to read you something here from the, the Psalms. Psalm 46, listen to verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We can praise even in the midst of struggle and pain because he is 
is with us. And that is how we're going to overcome. Let's praise him together. Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up. I stand on higher ground. Your praise rose in my heart and made this valley seem. Cause you have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. 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 You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Be seated, please. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Let's give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that comes from being in relationship with you. And we just pray that your spirit would be with, within us and help us to be a light to others. And we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. And we, we take uh, this bread now in remembrance of that gift and in full knowledge of the forgiveness that we so desperately need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for this cup, for the blood that was spilt, and for this reminder, this memorial, to remember what great a gift was given on that day. 
We love you. We thank you so much. We pray, Father, that you will continue to remind us of the depth of such great a gift and that you will help us to share that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, oh, oh. 
Спасибо. Hey, are you going to come back up here after? Sorry, we didn't talk about this. We did talk about it? I don't, re I don't recall. Sorry. After the sermon, we're going to come back up. Gotcha. It's good they know that we're human. Okay. okay. Sorry, I just couldn't remember what we were supposed to do. I like for things to go well, and that didn't go well. <laughs> uh, we're in this uh, series, Gmail, Seven Letters from God, and it's based on the book of Revelation, chapters one and uh, chapters two and three. If you want to flip over in your Bibles or on your device to the book of Revelation, last book in the New Testament, last book in the Bible, uh, it would be a, a good place for you to be. We'll be in chapter two this morning, verses eight through 11. Uh, my... <laughs> Not everybody agrees with this, and some of you, I'm pretty sure, don't agree with this, but my sense is that the book of Revelation was written around the end of the first century, 96-ish in the first century. So that's what I think. Um, and I want to jump ahead in their future, our past, about a half century, a little more than a half century, to the year 155 A.D., the second, middle of the second century. The, the Roman emperor at the time was a guy named Antoninus Pius. Um, and he was pretty popular uh, across the empire. The empire was enjoying a period of peace uh, because his father, uh, adoptive father, Hadrian, had pretty much conquered everybody. Um, and there were skirmishes on the border, but it was pretty much a time of peace a time of prosperity, and Antoninus was kind of an old-fashioned emperor. He um, liked the old ways where everybody in the empire would worship whatever god they wanted to, but included in the gods they worshipped would be the Caesars, particularly some of the... Antoninus didn't particularly want to be worshipped as a god himself, but he wanted to be sure that, that past emperors were honored that way. So there was a weird kind of humility there, uh, but he was really a fan of the old ways. Uh, he was particularly loved. He was adored by the people in an area that now, we now know as Turkey, but back then was called Anatolia or Asia. And um, that's where these seven churches were located. Uh, Ephesus and Smyrna and the rest of them were in Asia, and they loved this guy. They loved him because in the year 152 A.D., there was a massive earthquake in the region, and a lot of those cities were destroyed. And so Antoninus kind of started this uh, second century version of FEMA. He sent a ton of money to rebuild those cities. And so they absolutely adored this guy. They loved him in, the, in those cities. Um, and his favorite city was Ephesus. The, that's the, the church we looked at last week in the city of Ephesus. He loved Ephesus. He would go visit there sometimes when he sent his people to the region. That's the city they went to. And so Ephesus was really proud of being the favored city of Caesar. Smyrna, the city that we're going to look at this morning and the church that was located there, was pretty chafed by that. Smyrna and Ephesus had kind of a Tuscaloosa-Auburn thing going. They, Pergamum was in the mix too, but they were kind of like Troy, you know, or Jacksonville State. They never really quite got there, right? But, but Smyrna and Ephesus were always just right here. And Ephesus was the favorite, but Smyrna thought they should be. They were, the, the, it was a beautiful city, Smyrna was. It was called the Jewel of Asia. It had a bigger harbor. Their harbor was 40 miles long and so deep, ships could pull right up to the, sh right up to the shore and, and not, uh, fear, not be afraid of grounding their vessels. And so uh, Smyrna thought, we should be number one. We were the first to have a temple to the goddess Roma. They had a, they had a temple to the goddess Roma two centuries before 155 AD. And then they had temples to Tiberius and Augustus. So they were like, we, we should be the favorite but they weren't. So every now and then, what some of these cities would do would be to hold a purge. 
One way to curry favor with the Caesar would be to get rid of the atheists. Now, by atheists, I don't mean people who don't believe in the God of the Bible. Back then, if you were an atheist, you didn't worship Caesar. You didn't believe in the God. And so every now and then, cities like Smyrna would round up Christians and compel them to reject Christ and worship Caesar or, killed, or, 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 or be killed. So in, in one of these um, purges, they rounded up a bunch of Christians, and one of them was a 17-year-old kid named Germanicus. Uh, and they, they brought him to the arena. And the, the local uh, Roman proconsul saw him there in the arena, and he said, son, how old are you? And Germanicus said, I am 17. And the proconsul said, you have your whole life ahead of you. Renounce Christ, offer incense and worship Caesar as a god, say, hail Caesar, and you can live a, a, a happy life. And Germanicus, the 17-year-old Christian, gave the proconsul that look that teenagers can give. You know that look? That's the one right there, that one, right? They, he gave him that look that, te- that only a teenager can give an adult who doesn't get it and said, what? Curse my God? Never. And then they turned the lions loose into the arena. And the lions promptly laid down in the dirt and didn't do anything. And that enraged the Roman crowd. And so Germanicus, since the lions wouldn't charge him, Germanicus, the 17-year-old kid, charged the lions and grabbed one of them by the mane. And it killed him. And he went down as a great hero. And nobody renounced Christ because of that purge and because of the courage of Germanicus. And so the Roman officials realized, in Smyrna, they realized, the only, we're not going to get these people to renounce their faith in Christ by killing teenagers and women. We need to, go, we need to get their leader. And so they went after the leader, a man named Polycarp. Polycarp was nearing 100 years old at this point in his life. The imperial police came to his door, knocked on his door. He opened it, and they said, we're here to take you to the arena for your trial. And he said, well, come on in, have a seat. Uh, I'd like to pray for an hour. Would you like something to eat? So he fed the imperial police, and, and he prayed over them while they ate. He prayed for an hour, and then he prayed for another hour. And by the end of two hours, they were well-fed and um, well-watered, and they realized, we don't really want to arrest this old man. He's, he's old, he's harmless, he's so kind, and these prayers have been beautiful, but they didn't have much of a choice. So they put him on a horse, and they took him to the arena. And how his story ends is powerful. One of the greatest stories in Christian history. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute, but the reason I wanted to tell you that story to set up this passage is because when Polycarp was around the age of Germanicus, when he died, when Polycarp was in his teens, he was a member of the church in Smyrna and a disciple of the Apostle John. And in all likelihood, he was sitting in the church that morning when this letter was first read. This teenager was sitting in the church, and he heard these words. And as you'll find out when we get to the end of the sermon, they shaped his life. This is what he heard. This is the letter to the church at Smyrna. Verse 8, Revelation 2. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Let the poor say, I am rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you, will be, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. That's the letter that I think Polycarp heard when he was a teenager. I want to say two things about 
the situation of the Christians in Smyrna. And the first is, it's their struggle. Their struggle was real. I want you to notice what Jesus says to them in, in verse uh, 9. I know your afflictions. That word afflictions is a huge, huge word. Really wide arms that embraces a lot of anything that you can suffer health-wise, emotionally, relationally, physically, financially, spiritually, that word embraces all of that. Any kind of trouble you could experience is bound up in that word afflictions. And Jesus says, I know you got them. I know you're suffering. And they, they, they suffered all the same kind of things you and I suffer. Uh, if, if you're in a situation right now where you've got some relational struggles with somebody, they had that. If you're in a situation where you've got some financial struggles, they certainly had that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Health, they had all the same kind of health issues we have, except without our modern medicines, modern medical technology. So anything that was going on in your life was going on in theirs. And Jesus says, I know, I see it. He specifically mentions their poverty. I know your afflictions and your poverty. Now, one of the reasons that he would point that out is because Christianity has always been attractive, more attractive to people without resources than to people with resources. Christianity has always been more attractive to the poor than it is to people like us. One of the reasons is because people who are poor are accustomed to somebody else having control of their lives. People like us, we're accustomed to getting what we want. We can pay for it or we have influence and power to get our way to get what we want. So we're accustomed to that. The, the, the basic premise of Christianity is that the Lord's got to be in control of your life. You, you can't control your life and make your way to God. Only God can do that for you, and so you have to let go of that control and let God take that control. Jesus himself said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God, for the rule of God to be over your life. That's what kingdom of God means. So one of the reasons he singles out their poverty is because the church has always attracted the poor. The other reason he singles out their poverty is because in all likelihood they were poor, many of them were poor, because their property had been confiscated, their shops had been boycotted, their services had been excused, their paychecks had dried up because they refused to worship Caesar. If you weren't a part of Caesar worship, you didn't get to participate in the economic life of the community. So a lot of these folks had gone broke because they loved Jesus. So he singles that out. He identifies that. And then he mentions one other thing here in verse 9. He says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Uh, if we can just be honest, that sounds like something Louis Farrakhan would say or something you'd hear at an Aryan Nations white supremacist meeting, right? It's a little uncomfortable for us to read Jesus speaking through John calling a Jewish synagogue a synagogue of Satan. So I want to kind of call a timeout right here and talk about that for just a little bit. Because verse 9 has been used for centuries by people as an excuse or a justification for anti-Semitism. Uh, it sounds awkward in our ears. Jesus is saying it through John, so I think it needs a little explanation. Here's one of the reasons that Jesus can say that. Lisa and I learned very early in our marriage that there are some things she can say about her family that I can't say. <laughs> oh, you too. And she learned that there were certain things that I could say about my family that she couldn't say, right? Because they were blood kin, I'm blood kin. We've been married 36 <laughs> years. It feels like six, baby. And that's what we call a recovery, okay? We've been married 36 years, and it's still that way, okay? I, we still respect that there are limits to what we can say. It's that way in this passage right here. John and Jesus are Jews. That's family. Okay, I, I got another example that I want to use here, um, and I tested this out on somebody this week, and it made them uncomfortable. 
So I'm guessing it's, it's a good thing to say here, okay? And this could, I, I may really offend somebody with this, but if you'll notice, I'm not using a manuscript, so who knows, right? I have some uh, African-American friends in Atlanta, some black friends, and we, I haven't seen them in a while, but when we used to get together, they'd really get going. We'd all get going with each other. And they would use a word to describe each other, talking to each other. They would call each other a word. They'd call each other the N-word. And every every now and then, one of them would say to me, you are the N-word. They'd call me that, which I took as a huge compliment because what they were saying was, you're one of us, you're in, you're welcome. Here's what never happened in those conversations, what never will happen. I will never use that word speaking to them. I don't get to do that. That's their word now. White people had that word for a very long time, and we used it in destructive, hateful, demeaning ways. They took it back, and it's not our word anymore. If that word is in your vocabulary, it needs to go away, and you need to take that vocabulary to Jesus, ask his forgiveness, and ask him to clean that up, because that word is demeaning and degrading to people who were made in the image of God, and that's a sin, okay? John and Jesus can call the Jews the synagogue of Satan for two reasons. Number one, they're Jews, they get to use that. And number two, Jesus can see into the soul and know exactly what's going on inside of somebody. You and I can't do that. By the way, there's another phrase that should never come out of our mouths while we're talking about this. We'll go back to the sermon in a minute, I promise. I have some really good friends, some people I love uh, who are good, godly folks who recently have been accused of being in league with the devil. I mean, literally, somebody said, you're demonic, you've got the devil in you. What kind of hubris is there? How much hubris is there? What kind of arrogance does it take for somebody to think they can look inside somebody else's soul and know where they're coming from? Okay? We don't know. I'll talk more about the devil in a minute. But we don't know what's going on in somebody else's life. So we've got to be really careful with the language that we use. There are limits to what we can say. Using the N-word, saying anti-Semitic things, saying things against Hispanics or Asians or whites or anybody else, calling somebody the devil, none of that should be in the vocabulary of a Christian. Okay? All of that from verse 9. We're going to move on now. And you can send me an email. My email is lincoln at Twickenham. <laughs> Com. Okay. The other thing he says, he says, your struggle is real. I know your afflictions. I know that people are outing you to the Romans. That's what the Jews in, in Smyrna were doing. They were outing them to the Romans. Verse 10, he says, l- look at it again. He says, don't be afraid of what you, okay, I know things are really hard right now. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. It's going to get worse. The devil is going to put some of you in prison and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. 10 days is an apocalyptic language way of saying it's gonna be a long time. It's not gonna last forever, but you're gonna endure persecution for a very long time. Be faithful, even to the point of death. Jesus says, your struggle is real. It's gonna get worse. Okay, let me share uh, three takeaways with you here as uh, we kind of gonna bring this to a close. First, take away the spiritual, and that this passage teaches the spiritual and the physical are interactive realities. Verse 10 again, the devil was not literally going to knock on the door and read somebody their Miranda rights and put them in cuffs and take them to jail. The imperial police were going to do that. What Jesus is telling this church through John is that when that happens, the devil is behind it. Scripture teaches over and over that there is more to reality than what you and I can see with our eyes and experience with our senses and control with our technology and understand with our science. There is another reality out there, another dimension, if you will, a spiritual dimension. And what happens in that dimension has an impact on this one. And what happens in this one has an impact on that dimension. 
Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 5 that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers and principalities and rulers and the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So put on the full armor of God. That's why things like prayer and scripture and confession are so critical to the Christian life because that's how we engage that spiritual dimension. Peter warned his readers, be watchful, be vigilant, your enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's out there, he's looking for you. The next time you experience a temptation, whatever that temptation may be, go to a website you've got no business going to. Put something into your body that does not belong in your body. Try to develop a relationship that you know doesn't need to be developed. Cross a line that you know does not need to be crossed physically, sexually. The next time you face that temptation, I want you to think to yourself, the physical and the spiritual are interactive realities. This temptation is coming from Satan, and he wants to undermine my soul. He wants to devour me. That will empower you to say no to it. Second takeaway, the approval of God does not mean the absence of suffering. This is a place where I really want us to live for the rest of our service because we're going to go into a, a, a period where we just kind of sing here for a minute and you're going to have an opportunity to reach out to somebody for prayer. But I, I, I worry that a lot of us right now are right here. We, we are going through something really bad. I've talked to some people this week who've had some horrible diagnoses, terrifying diagnoses. Talked to some folks that have had family members that have heard news that's just devastating. Some of us are experiencing some financial crises right now. I know we're struggling with how we're going to pay the bills. Some of us are dealing with addictions. There's all kind of stuff going on in the life of this church. Relational problems, marriages are in trouble. We're going through this suffering, and there's this sense that we feel that because this suffering is present in my life, God is absent. And I, I totally get that. I understand that. I have felt that way before. Sometimes I even feel that right now, these days, that, you know, God must not be happy with me because this is happening in my life. But that's just not the truth. Isaiah called Jesus a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Hebrews 5 says that Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he's been through all of it. Chapter 4 says that suffering was the price that Jesus paid to be the pioneer of our salvation. So Jesus has been through all of this. If he suffered, doesn't it make sense that we're going to suffer too sometimes? And that suffering does not mean that God is absent from your life. So here's the last one. If you're in a season of struggle right now, Jesus has already been there. If you're in a season of struggle... Jesus has been there. In verse 8, he says, when he introduces himself to this church, he says, these are the words of him who was the first and the last, the one who died. The one who died. And then in, back in chapter 1, he said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. Let me tell you something. You don't have to be afraid to go any place to which Jesus holds the key. And he holds the key to death. So you don't have to be afraid of that. Worst thing that can happen to us, Jesus has already been through it. He has already endured what we face. He has already conquered what we fear. He has already been where we are. And because of that, we can endure I told you about Polycarp as we were beginning. Let me finish his story. They took him to the arena, and they put him in the middle of the arena, and they asked him to confess. They, and it was the opposite they, they did with Germanicus uh, earlier. Instead of saying, you're 17 years old, you got your whole life ahead of you, the proconsul said, look, you're an old man. You're, you're almost 100 years old. Denounce Christ and, and, and die the way an old man should die. And Polycarp said this, he said, 
Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has never done me wrong. How could I blaspheme my king and my savior? Then he said, you threaten me with a fire that burns for a moment, and it will be quenched when you are not ready for the fire that will burn forever. It's pretty straight up. And then the last thing he said was, Lord, I thank you that I'm able to drink the cup my Savior drank. And they lit the fire. And the story goes that the fires did not touch his body, that it, it billowed out. And so they thrust a spear through his heart, just the way they thrust a spear into Christ. He died faithful to his Lord. I think because he heard that letter when he was a teenager, and that letter was heard over and over and over by him and by the other people in that church for the next half century. Okay, as we draw this to a close, here's, here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to spend some, Lincoln, you guys can come on back up. We're going to spend some time with three songs that, that, that talk about the presence of God in our lives, even in the midst of struggle. Let me go ahead and ask our shepherds and their wives and uh, ministers if you guys can take spots around the room. Um, our elders and, and staff are going to be available for you to go to for prayer. And here's, here's what I'm asking you. I know some of us are dealing with some really hard stuff right now. One of the ways God is there for us is through his people. And so we want to be there for you. During the next three songs, you can make your way to one of these folks and ask them to pray for you. We've got somebody in the balcony and somebody around the sides of the room here. If you, if you need to go out to the room out here, just say, hey, walk with me out here. Let's go to a private place where we can talk. Do not leave this room today alone in your struggle. If it's a sin you're dealing with and trying to, to master, it's trying to master you and you're trying to deal with it, tell somebody and let us pray with you. If it's a sorrow that is burdening your heart, don't leave here today with that sorrow. If it's a relational struggle in your marriage, don't leave here today alone in that struggle. People in this room love you and care for you. Jesus will minister through them to you. You will not be alone in that. We want to stand and want to stay seated for a while. Let's stand, make your way to somebody, and let us pray for you. Abide with me, fast falls the
Listen, um, I know a lot of folks have uh, gone to somebody for prayer, and good for you. If there is a struggle that you just didn't feel comfortable talking about with somebody today, give us a call at the office, and don't, don't be in that alone. The Lord can be with you in that struggle. Let me just pray over us, and we're going to be dismissed. So glad you were here today. If you have any questions about anything we've said or done today, please give us a call. We want to hear those. Let's pray. God, you are good to us. It is good to know that whatever struggle we face right now, Jesus has been through that. You didn't need to come to earth to know that because you made us, but it's good for us to know that a human being named Jesus, who was fully God and fully human, experienced all the heartache and all the struggle all the, all the things that we are burdened with and that he knows. He doesn't minimize it. He doesn't dismiss it as if it's not real. He knows it is. And because of that, we're not alone. And God, we are so thankful to know that he has been through it and gone to the other side and that he can lead us through whatever struggle we face, that through his life, 
we can overcome any death. Thank you for that good knowledge. Help us to support one another and encourage one another with these words. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week.